You want me did to bring Nick in? Yeah, did you get a chance to read his email? I did, yep. Okay. It's very well written, concise. I agree. I was tempted to say, like, <clears throat> should we have him read that at the onset as the sort of guiding point for the talk, or...? Uh, I wouldn't... Yeah. Uh, hey, Nick. Hey, can you see me okay? I can't see anything. I don't have my video function on. Okay. And honestly, honestly, it's better just not to have that on anyway, for the sake of latency. I agree. Actually, as soon as I find the video creates a lag in the call. That, I would I love to see your face, Nick, but... Yeah, you're a handsome man, but... Oh, you guys... So, sorry about the time. Obviously, I don't know how to properly interpret time zones. And I thought... Oh, this, <laughs> is, this is better for me, anyway. Good. My Skype... Uh, I don't know. I'm just... It's lagging. I don't know if it's... Let me, let me get off the call and restart. I'm sorry. So, you guys can keep talking, and then I can join after. But this is... Uh, I should make sure this is going to work. Okay, cool. Yeah. Okay, I'll be back. I'll be back. Yeah, I just was muted because I was slurping some soup. <laughs> Gotta eat the soup. It's, uh... Are you, you guys are heading into summer now. It's getting cold as fuck here, so... Yeah. Oh, are you still in Carolina? And where? No, you weren't in Carolina. You were in. Oh, I did. I did live in North Carolina for um, about a year and a half. I did. Um, I've spent the last two years living in Virginia, though. Uh, I and was... now you're moving to Miami. <laughs> oh yeah. I wasn't planning on moving to Miami. I just said I need to visit at some point in the year 2017. Uh, don't kid yourself. You're moving there. Uh, doesn't get, doesn't I don't get know if you've ever been to Miami. Miami. That's I don't. You've never met me in person, and I don't know if you've ever visited Miami, but I don't think we're compatible. Now I need to go to Google. I'm the kind of guy that wears like jeans and a long sleeve shirt to the beach. Why? I don't know. Uh, I don't know weird body issues or so. I don't like. I, you're gonna make me like psychoanalyze it. I'm um, just not comfortable, you know. You're not comfortable in your own body. Oh God, is anybody? I would say I am. I mean, I probably need to get my teeth looked at, but other than that, I think I'm okay. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I mean, I'm fine. I don't walk around being. It doesn't matter. I'm just saying, I'm not gonna hang out in a. Uh, you know, town that's entire industry is like beach beauty culture, you know? I do know. I, I, that that uh, doesn't suit most of us. I'm trying to look up this nonsense about the Hampstead kids. About the what? The Hampstead kids. What's that? Uh, it was this thing in England that happened with uh, this little boy and his sister apparently claiming to have been abused by their father and how their father was involved in this massive cult and satanic rituals and all that. Um, and it was this YouTube video filmed in... Oh, God, uh, I would be guessing. But uh, basically these children were... Uh, their parents were going through this messy divorce and the stepdad, uh, Papa Hemp, uh, was came up with this ridiculous story. And so on the thing you hear this little boy going, yeah, Wednesday's our sex day. We have a lot of sex on Wednesday. Um, but, uh, again, 
again. Again, it's one of these things with like this story, but no evidence. And what was the other one? The it starts with M. There was some kindergarten. Um, yeah. Like the Satanic Panic. What was that one called? Oh, I, if there was a specific case that prompted the Satanic Panic, I'm not sure. Uh, I don't yeah, there know. Was. This, was. This is never, I mean, for what it's worth, and I told John when he asked me to do this call, this has never been um, one of the rabbit holes that I really found myself uh, pursuing. Um, mm. I don't, I have no doubt that there is very real crime that happens uh, I mean you know obviously I've I've known plenty of people who are have been sexually abused throughout their lives by family members and things like that I know obviously I don't take any of that lightly the idea of the institutionalized or sort of um, organized structured uh, pedophile rings I again I, I don't doubt it I mean there's uh, people elites powers will trade weapons and lives and countries and political power. I don't doubt that there would be a, uh, a hunger to abuse children as well if you can abuse everything else. If you're trying to rape everything that's good and pure in this world, I don't think you would stop yourself at children. Uh, so it's not that I, I doubt it. Uh, I've just never really like done the investigation to find smoking guns or, or guilty parties, you know, stuff like that. Um, I felt a little out of my element when John asked me to do this. Little children, you better not tell on me. I'm telling you, little children, you better not tell what you see. And if you could, I'll give you candy. I'm gonna treat you to a movie Stop your giggling, children do be nice By little sugars and spice You saw me kissing your sister Did I miss much? Uh, boy, Nick and I spoke for like a minute or two, and then him and I lost our call, and I can't get him back. Okay. Well, we'll figure it out. <laughs> so, uh, last time I texted you, you said you, uh, you were like in the car driving back from North Carolina. Oh. Yeah, that would have been like, uh, like last Monday or something. Yeah, I actually went to visit my dad. So, oh, that's where your dad lives. Well, my dad moved. He actually lives in South Carolina. I'm not sure what the town's called. It's like just south of Charlotte is where he lives. So okay. I, I guess uh, 
I, I, ignorance in my geography, but I'm assuming that means Charlotte's on the border of North and South Carolina. Mm-hmm. And because uh, I think he's only maybe 20 minutes away from Charlotte or something. Like he actually works in Charlotte, but he's on the South Carolina side of the border. <clears throat> anyway, we looked at like drive times and it was like six hours between us. And there was really only one day that our schedules matched up. So what we decided to do was just pick like a halfway point and I drove three hours down. He drew he, he drove excuse me, drove three hours up and we just met in the middle at some little roadside bar and grill thing and hung out for a few hours and then turned around. How often do you get to see him? I haven't seen my father since two thousand fourteen. Okay. So a while. Before that would have been a some some point in 2011 or 12. So yeah, it's like every, you know, two or three years. I feel, <laughs> yeah, I feel like. Well, I mean, I guess that hasn't been the exact relationship with my father, but I mean, I don't even I don't even fucking talk to him when I'm not home. It's too difficult for each of us, so we just avoid it. Yeah. So until we set up our little play dates, it's basically zero contact. But I'm okay with that. I don't, I don't know what your father's like, but mine, I can't be around because we're too similar but on opposite sides of things, so it's impossible. I I never thought, well... My father and I are probably way more similar than I'd like to admit. Yep. And it's, uh, it's a horrifying thing to face up to. Especially, like in, especially in the last year or so, I've realized how much I've I've repeated so many of his fucking mistakes, and it was the one thing I promised myself I'd never do. Um, I just didn't. Yeah, Whatever. I didn't want to end up. That's it's not that it's not that he's in uh, such a bad position or that he's a bad man or anything like that. It's just whatever. I didn't. No, you see things in people's lives that you would think that you would be regretful about and not want to be on your mind and like, you know, so yeah, I get it. I get it. I'm the same way and I've committed sins too, but it's like you can't escape your <laughs> I don't know if it's the genes, but if there's something there. Like hereditary is a real thing. Hello, Nick. Hey. Who are we talking about? Daddy issues. Daddy issues. Yeah. Um, I think for me... You- I was just hoping, it's like I said, he's not such a bad person. I was just hoping to, like, break the cycle of historical stupidity, you know? Yes. <laughs> right, right. It's a hard thing to do. I guess that's what we're all trying to do. Nick, I always think back on last time we talked to you, like, what what are we doing? I always, I always come back to that phrase. It's like, what the fuck am I doing or what are we doing? And... Sometimes it's the small stuff, like, oh, I don't want to just be stupid like that human <laughs> in my life who I view as, uh, whatever. It's these small decisions and these small little goals we set for ourselves. Oh, well, I mean, if we're talking about fathers, God, how long do we have? Uh, not long enough, so that's probably why we shouldn't go there, but... Uh... <laughs> I mean, if you if there's anything you like, feel free to use this platform for whatever. Um, but uh, maybe another time we can uh, we can have a whole episode about where I come from and and all that. Um, but not today. All good. I'm okay with that I'll, too. Uh, well, I guess for the sake of the official recording now. Do you want to read what you sent to Alan and I, or would you just like to use it as sort of a jumping-off point? How would you like to approach that? Well, I think some of it is worth reading, definitely. I mean, maybe maybe I can read it, but we can sort of uh, interrupt it. Yeah, I like that approach, actually. Keeping in mind that it is just a draft, and there's plenty of spelling mistakes, because I wrote it on the iPad, and... It wouldn't. It wouldn't accept Andras as a name, so it changed it to Andreas. <laughs> it's pretty. It's pretty clear otherwise, though. 
so well done. Oh, uh, thanks. Well, I think the last major episode that I heard, well, the very last episode I heard was The Act of Killing. Mm-hmm. And I haven't watched that film. But I think that it ties into what we're going to talk about. And I guess you reached out to me two days ago, I think, and said, you know, this whole pizza gate has erupted. And last time you were on the show, you said, what are we doing? And so I guess, well, let me put it back on you, John. Why did you reach out to me specifically to talk about this issue? I appreciate your level of critical thinking and your objectivity and your rules of evidence. You actually have rules of evidence. There's a lot of negative things to say from academia and pursuing the sort of academic track in life, but it applies and you can develop a rigor and an appreciation for standards and parameters in finding what is quote unquote good information versus bad information and so on. Whether we trust something fully or not, of course, it's all a probability game. But uh, I think there's more effective ways of sifting through information, and I'm still sort of seeing that faltering here. And quite frankly, if we want to have a truly self-organizing system that creates a sustainable society, we need good information. And I guess that's, of course, subjective, but what does that mean? Humans have the capacity for lying and hiding the truth and natural systems don't do that so they evolve like they're supposed to but humans have the power sort of over their own evolution in that sense it's how honest do we want to be and like how petty do we want to be and what is a high integrity existence these are all real questions that are effective and necessary if we want to keep moving into the future and not fucking collapse so I see it as a part of a larger issue in that sense of survival and sustainability as an information system, but also just what are we accomplishing in alternative perceptions with this sort of, I find it sensationalist and part of the theater state that I object to in our political system, on television. It's all just sort of like more reality TV stuff that I don't really appreciate. So that's sort of where I'm at, and that's why I brought you in. Not to create an echo chamber, not for you to tell me I'm right. I would just like to hear your perspective on it, because looking around people, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know what the st- what people's standards of evidence are anymore. And uh, not everything is free association. You can't just go through life freely associating and finding truth. It's not... Synchronicity is a powerful tool, but you can't fucking apply it to everything. You can't use... You can't use it like a blunt instrument, is what I'm saying. And I find a lot of blunt instrument type applications of of thinking processes. Can I just jump in here real quick? One of the things that sort of uh, killed my momentum when I was doing those Sync Quick News segments was I did that one about September 11th and all the like 93s and 77s and stuff like that and showing the sort of esoteric symbolism in the event. And uh, that video on on Facebook in particular, not so much on YouTube, but <clears throat> on Facebook, that video got shared a ridiculous amount of times, right? And like all these conspiracy theorists sharing it, you know, but it got way outside of our circle of people. And for all, uh, by all sort of measures, the most successful or quasi-viral moment we had there but my reaction to it was seeing all these people on facebook you you could see like who shared it unless they have like their privacy settings you can kind of look at who's sharing it and what the comments on it are or whatever and everyone sort of had this idea as if i laid out this information to say look this is the smoking gun that it was some say satanic ritual you know being and here's here's the evidence of that and uh or, or quasi satanic or thelemic or whatever right and seeing this stuff that they were pointing out yes i made all these connections they saw this as ah look this guy has proven this point and my thing was like whoa i don't think that's proof of anything like it's proof of of that the connections are, are there but it is not proof of criminality 
And it's funny, I made my follow-up video is the worst view count or any response that I got to any Sync Quick News. <laughs> you know, it was like total shit. No one cared was basically me saying what Nick says in his writing here, which is criminal acts. If we're discussing criminal acts, we have to approach it with a different standard. And that's not to say, obviously, I put full credence in what we're doing uh, and the way we're exploring synchronicity and the metaphysical nature of reality and esoterica, blah, 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 blah. But I feel that if we are trying to say this person committed a crime, we really have – not that we have a perfect justice system by any stretch of the imagination, far, far from it, but the concepts of criminal justice – as as we understand it of can we prove these things that we're not incriminating the wrong person that we're like i just feel like the the, the standards have to be rigorous and and things like synchronicity or or things that of a more abstract nature kind of get have to be put aside uh jason barrera and i had a comment uh, jason barrera made a comment to me a few years ago we were just talking about stuff, and he's like, if I wanted to, I could prove that, you know, Charles Manson killed uh, the Black Dahlia, you know, he's like, through synchronicity. That doesn't mean that that's true in a physical reality sense, but I could say that this, you know, these people, I can connect to these people, and I can sort of play, but, but obviously this isn't who committed this crime, you know. The point is, I think what Nick was getting at in his piece and John, what you're trying to say here and what I was trying to say after my uh, 9-11 video is like, we need, we need to approach this stuff. If this is the goal, if the goal is to find the smoking gun and I don't know, prosecute or, or whatever, we need to find that smoking gun, not create this sort of echo chamber. Of kind of you know looser connections. Does that does that sound accurate? It's accurate to me. So Nick, what do you think? Well, I have a very different take on it because I mean, what are we like end of November, and last week was the 53rd anniversary of JFK's assassination. Can we at this point? you know, half a century later, even really with any confidence, say that a gun was involved in JFK's assassination? I mean, that's my question. What is the chain of evidence that you can demonstrate to me that says this gun was involved? Well, what... So it's a weapon at a distance. His head exploded, right? Yeah, but then Mark LeClaire says that his head exploded because he suddenly understood the nature of the entire universe. Yeah, but... <laughs> Which I, 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 think, I think that's a joke. It is, yeah. But, but that's no less of a theory. If we're talking theories, there's no more evidence that he was shot in the sense of what I can easily put my hands on and look at to say that he was shot than... Mark LeClaire saying he said just spontaneously exploded. Now, just to be clear, you, when you, you, there was a little qualifier you put in there. No more evidence that you can put your hands on. And that's, that's sort of a, the, the distinction, right? Is that there might very well be fantastic for forensic evidence that a gun was utilized in JFK's assassination. You will never see that forensic evidence. Precisely. Precisely. And then there's, like, the whole idea that, um, oh, who was the Tippett? Officer Tippett? You know? The whole idea that he was uh, shot, and that seems like a massive anomaly. Why would you shoot a police officer after you've shot a president if that is, and I'm going to use the word here, if that is the narrative? And then some people have taken that and speculated that, in fact, Officer Tippett was shot because he had a striking resemblance to JFK and, therefore, 
uh, his cadaver could be used to um, demonstrate trajectory of bullet holes and things like that. Okay, it's a nice story, but again, I cannot look at any document. I cannot verify that. And I think that's where we're at here. So you're saying, all right, so I think maybe it would help if we starting off reading some of that material, because like we're, we're, I feel like we're having a conversation based on something that I, we, you either, here's something else to say is you can read it. The other thing I could do is I could post that text for listeners um, so that they can read it in their, at their leisure, you know, uh, as a sort of primer. Uh, yeah, primer, exactly, or just supplementary material for this. Um, but I think... There's probably there's probably only one section that I would be concerned about in that extent, is that I have a list of 21 items, which are, quote-unquote, the media that I listen to, uh, and that is not at all reflective of my entire con- media consumption habits. Uh, so the only thing... With that, I'm more than happy for you to post it, and I think it would be a good sort of addendum to this conversation. But just to say that 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 list is just a random list, and I got bored after putting 20 items in. Uh, I probably listened to over 100 different sources. But just to be clear, so you you were prompt. You start this off by responding to a question. So I believe it was always record 167 episode titled Triumph of the Ill, and uh, Andras Jones asks this question a number of times, what media sources do you trust? As if, mm. is there a, is there one, you know, is it, do you like CNN? Do you like NPR? Are you more of an alternative media? Do you like, do you trust Alex Jones? Do you whatever? And you sort of took this to the... Um, Leclerian nth degree of what what is what does that word even mean? Like at what point do we trust? What does it mean to to trust? And what are the distinctions between? Are we saying I agree with this person's perspective as they give me news analysis, or do we even trust the information that they're presenting? You give the example like. Uh, if I watch the nightly news and they say, hey, there was a fire on 3rd Street and blah, 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 and they have photographs and video of this fire, and it's, if it's a local news story, you could probably go and actually drive over there and see if there is, in fact, a burned out building or whatever. There are some things that you can verify, but the majority of the quote-unquote stories or, or underlined stories that we're getting in any media source, we either have to trust blindly that this is, we're at least working from some basic ground of this information you're sharing with me is in some way accurate before I can try and tear down your narrative. You know, say, oh, Sandy Hook school shooting, right? So, you have people say, no, actually, it was not a school shooter. It was this. That's still, they're both presupposing that actually there is even a place called Sandy Hook or that there's a school there or, or whatever. You know, I think you're trying to take this to the degree of what, as a mental exercise, what can we even begin to, how do we even begin to piece together these narratives or trust the narratives before we can even get to the finer nuances of how those stories are being reported. Is that correct? I think that's probably a reasonable summation. Um, can you give me two minutes? My dog is going crazy and I just want to find out why. Yeah. Otherwise it's going to come into the recording. So I'm just going to go on mute for two minutes. I can still hear you guys, but uh, you won't be able to hear me, okay? Okay, that's fine. So I did hear a dog bark. That's one piece of evidence I have to support Nick's story. (laughs) But I have no way of knowing if Nick even has a dog. (laughs) 
Oh, the relativism can get so fucking deep and the the sophistry. It's just, yeah, I'm interested to see where this goes. Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll be blunt. So I'm I'm totally comfortable, you know, playing this 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 mental game. At the same time, I don't know. Does this get? Is this a further out, you know, obfuscation of of the details, or is this getting? To the bigger picture, I don't know. Right. Well, okay. So let's let's start with why John even bothered to reach out to me. I guess the first thing is, who am I? I, you know, I like to say, you know, I'm the voice from the land of Oz in this context to fit into the broader picture of what that means synchronistically. I live in Australia, O, Z, N, Y, that kind of thing. Through the looking glass, down the rabbit hole, polar inverse, uh, the nature of a polar, you know, swap. I'm close to the South Pole, you're close to the North Pole. So uh, we get a totally different perspective on things. Also, I'm outside looking in. So when it comes to American politics, as I mentioned in this piece, for me, it's entertainment. And so for you, dear listener, what I want to communicate at this point is that I am not an oracle. I am not some wise sage that Alan Green and and John McGuire call up to get the truth on things. Uh, I have no... Ability to connect to the Akashic record and tell you a deeper meaning of things. I just have a perspective. Like you, the listener, you also have a perspective. Like Alan, you have a perspective. John, you have a perspective. So I think it's important to remember uh, the silent member of this conversation, which is the listening audience, and... With that in mind, I think that we should look at the question at hand, which is Pizzagate. So if you'll allow me to to read a short uh, section, and then we can move the conversation on from there. Mm -hmm. Okay, so yesterday, I mean, I've been aware of Pizzagate probably since the week before the election, when Anthony Weiner was hauled up in terms of the... FBI or whatever it happened to be with Comey. And the story seems to have developed significantly since then via channels such as Reddit and 4chan. So I've, I've, I've had a good look at the rabbit hole, so to speak. What I can ascertain is that there is a lot of smoke here and there are some deep rabbit holes that are going to foment speculation. So we're looking at a very fertile ground for confirmation bias in this anti-Clinton climate. And I think what we need to do before we move on anywhere in terms of Pizzagate, and then we can get onto the broader question of media and trust, is let's take Pizzagate as a case study and let's have a look at what we actually have. So in terms of the actual evidence without any interpretation, without any speculation, I think what we really have is a very questionable use of the First Amendment. And as far as I understand, again, as an outsider looking in, the First Amendment is the right to free speech. So is it kind of uh, an issue if someone in a position of power is using code words? Well, it really depends on the context, doesn't it? So what we know is that there are a series of emails and within those emails there are some sentences that just make no sense whatsoever. You know, quotes like, how about we do pizza for an hour? Like, I'd never mention that to anybody. I would say something like, hey, do you want to grab some pizza? Should we have pizza for dinner? Do you want to go out for pizza? They're the kind of linguistic context in which I would use this particular word. So it appears, in terms of what is a priori evidence, that linguistically at least, these words, pizza, hot dogs, 
cheese past a handkerchief are not being used in a in a normal context. So without speculating too much, perhaps we can say this is code. Okay. Now, we all have our own lingos, we all have our own ways of speaking, mannerisms, idioms, etc., etc. So in the sync book realm, and in particular in Always Record, we say things that to the general public might appear to be strange, might appear to be out of context. Definitely in a political realm, such as the White House, such as running a country, code words are, are, are very important in terms of uh, national security, in terms of things like you don't want to be openly speaking about nuclear warfare or something like that. So code words are always used. But in this regard, we have an unverified list of what those codes mean. Cheese being little girls, or pizza being little girls, hot dogs being boys, I don't know, right? So we have a whole lot of emails that were released following this investigation into what I deem to be confirmed inappropriate inappropriate sexual interaction between Anthony Weiner and a 14-year-old girl. I have no reason to doubt that that happened, that he was texting an actual human being who was female who was 14 years old. And look, I think there's a deeper discussion with the word I just used, female, there, because definitely if you want to look at it from a political spectrum, the right wing is saying political correctness has gone mad and the left wing is saying, well... You know, gender is fluid and this and that and the other. What I'm trying to designate is that from a perverse heterosexual, you know, situation context, Anthony Weiner was texting a girl who was, uh, you know, too young to be involved in that conversation with him. That alone should be something that that we take seriously because that is perhaps where we actually have a victim okay we have a 14 year old girl who is being caught up in something that is deemed inappropriate by if not all then most modern or contemporary societies okay then we have a very questionable and highly highly inappropriate instagram account from james elefante and there's a photo of him wearing a T-shirt that says, I love infants. Obviously, if you translate his name into French, it comes out as Jamais la Infance, which means I love infants. This is all very strange. And I would, I, one question I have here is, is James Elephantus his real name? Is that what's on his birth certificate, or has he changed that? And if he has changed that, then I have a lot more questions. As I said, there is some smoke here, but as yet, we have found no fire. So this this character, James Elephantus, owns a pizza parlor. Now, as far as this pizza parlor goes, I I, you know, there's a lot of speculation that there are logos and things which match an FBI list. Again, I think that that is wanting to make a connection than seeing an actual connection. And again, we have some more questionable use of the First Amendment in terms of murder and killing in connection to a picture of some kind of windowless room. And I am being very careful with my language here, guys. I know that the people listening to this will be like, why is he being so pedantic about saying windowless room or whatever? The reason is because I want to take the speculation out. I don't want to use words that have immediate connotation, okay? So I just want to put onto the table before we go further with this conversation what is actual. Then we have an abundance of circumstantial evidence of collusion between these characters and members of the White House. James Elephantus on his inappropriate Instagram account has a a letter addressed to him from Hillary Clinton. So circumstantially, we have some kind of connection that we can say, okay, 
that seems legitimate. We also have an inappropriate comment from Vice President Biden in front of a young lady, and then there's a lot of kind of talk here. Did he say, I'm very horny to be in front of this young girl, or did he say, I'm very honoured to be in front of this young girl? Either way, I agree that this is not an appropriate comment from anyone, and in particular, someone who is representing the United States government. Okay, then we have some disturbing performances, I guess is what you could call them, by a so-called artist that involved red liquid. Again, I'm being pedantic. I don't know what it is, so let's call it a red liquid, to write uh, what I deem to be incoherent nonsense on a white wall. Finally, we have a photo of John Podesta with, uh, on his right hand, the number 14, and on his left hand, a fish. And this is very confusing, but if we take Marty Leeds, who is a, a member of the Thinkbook community, he's done a wonderful analysis that highlights how the Podestas may be aware of symboli symbolism related to the Skull and Bones group. Okay, so that's what we have. What we do not have is a victim. What we do not have is hard evidence, and this could be in the form of DNA, blood, a body, a confession, a victim, right? We do not have any of that, and publicly at least. I'm not saying that it doesn't exist, but publicly, on YouTube, on anything, we have nobody coming forward, no whistleblowers, no one saying, I have seen this myself, right? We have artwork, which is very, very disturbing. I would not hang any of that in my house. I wouldn't even encourage anybody to look at it. So I, th I, th I think that these are questionable characters, but we do not have anything that forms hard evidence. So if I were in a position to prosecute, then right now, based on what I've just laid out, I have a number of questions, in particular for the Podesta brothers and probably from there for the Clintons. But with what I've just laid out, there is absolutely nothing that links any kind of criminal activity to these people. So this is a big deal, Pizzagate. And I actually think it's a good thing, because we've been bombarded with symbolism, we've been bombarded with occult practices since the event of the advent of the media as we know it. So I definitely encourage heat going the other way. I definitely encourage WikiLeaks. I encourage 4chan and Reddit researchers. I encourage this thing going viral, viral, and I encourage speculation being cast on these people, suspicion being cast on these people. But saying that, this is not proof of anything. At this stage, there is no evidence that even a single child has been harmed. And this is really critical to keep in mind. As far as hard evidence goes, the closest thing I've found is a spike in missing children reported in the Virginia area. And the anomaly here is that more than half of those are reported without any sort of picture. And that is very suspicious. So, as I said, there's a lot of smoke but there is no proof and certainly no reason to trust anybody at all in any realm, including us right now talking in regard to this narrative. However, in terms of narrative, and that's where I want to talk to you guys today, in, in this space, narrative space, this is a very old narrative. And this goes all the way back to Cassandra and the fall of Ch Troy with young children being sacrificed by the ruling class. So keep in mind, for those of you who study classics, that Agamemnon sacrificed his daughter for favourable routes en route to Troy. So in terms of Pizzagate, and then hopefully we can move on from Pizzagate, because I really don't want to spend our time today discussing this I don't have enough information. I don't have enough kind of insight. I can't offer any more of an informed opinion about that. So I would like to move on to narratives in general. But my take on Peter Gate is this. It is very interesting. There is a lot here to be suspicious of. 
but nothing illegal has surfaced. So what I would say is let's keep our cool, let's keep our powder dry. And in other words, it's about time to stop thinking about imaginary children. If real children surface, fine, but let's not jump to speculation. Let's not think that these things are happening and then speculate and end up with a, um, you know, a Martin preschool situation or a Hampstead situation. Let's instead keep our cool. Let's keep our kind of ear to the ground. Let's, let's keep the heat on these people. Definitely, because it is suspicious and we all have questions, but let's not get carried away. What I would say, and this is, this is one of the most wonderful things I took from reading Bram Stoker's Dracula, is Festina Lente. And that is Latin for hurry slowly. Let's really hurry slowly here. Let's double check everything. Let's make sure that we are on top of things. And what I would rather like to discuss is let, how can we as, as consumers of media, having had years of, of propaganda, having had years of education, how can we empower ourselves with skills that we can use to learn how to learn? So that's, that's kind of where uh, I want to start with that. So reading over and perhaps uh, I'll get your take on what I've said, and, and then we can go to sort of Andras' question about media sources and trust. So, uh, I, I, first of all, I like, I like your sort of sober, again, this is, this is not how I would normally try and have a conversation about most subjects, but it's, it almost is that sort of, uh, trivium like rationality, even headedness, can we just look at what evidence is here? What what are we actually presented with? And, and yet, still keeping this innate reason about us of there's something something supremely suspicious. So, uh, in one of the one of the names you listed in your source of media was Thomas Sheridan, and I just want to read to you um, real quick thing he put on Facebook earlier. He said, I've spent the last few days reading over the WikiLeaks Podesta emails in order to basically debunk it as bullshit. I read, reread, and consider all the evidence very carefully. Well, I have to admit, there is abs- there absolutely is well-coded language within these cu- communications that do cause great need for concern. The fact that the same terms constantly appear in unusual context, such as playing dominoes on pizza, quote unquote, has justifiably raised people's concerns. Uh, he says, especially in light of his visits to the sex resort island of the pedophile pimp Epstein. And that's, that's like, we can kind of take that as a little, uh, addendum there. But he says, uh, does this prove anything conclusively? Yes, that a uniquely codified language composed of secretive conventions of terminology were being used by an inner circle, and the meanings are known only to the inner circle, so to speak. I can think of only two instances where such coded terminology would be used, espionage or criminal activities. People are correct to be suspicious. It's in things like that. Now, you you kept using phrases like, questionable use of the First Amendment, which uh, I love that sort of even-tempered, yes, they have, they are speaking freely and have the right to do so, and yet they are also speaking in clearly codified uh, phrasing. Unless you can break that code, it still remains highly suggestive and it's a it's a red flag, but what is it? What is it evidence of? Just just as you say, there's smoke. You know, has the fire been found yet? Possibly not. I find it hard to believe there's only two possibilities for coded language, and it's only espionage or criminal activity. I I was just reading somebody else's. I know, but I'm saying that's an, that's an absurd conclusion, in my opinion. Right. But anyway, that's not bad. I mean, it's. It's okay to to come out of it suspicious and oh these things are odd but 
just a couple of things, Nick, that you pointed out there. Say the Podesta hand thing. So I, we're not going to go over all the evidence, but I'm just saying there's something in circumstantial evidence that it's basically... I'll just read it. There's often more than one logical conclusion inferable from the same set of circumstances. In cases where one conclusion implies a defendant's guilt and another his innocence, the, quote, benefit of the doubt principle, end quote, would apply. Indeed, if the circumstantial evidence suggests a possibility of innocence, the prosecution has the burden of disproving that possibility. So with the thing, say, with the Podesta hand things, okay? So there's a fish on one hand and a 14 on the other. Now everyone just immediately ties that to the Horus myth and that clearly he's connected to an occult uh, society where they discuss these things and he's obviously learned in these things. But if you actually go back to maybe an email before or something, there was actually communications about a, uh, a global initiative number 14 about preserving underwater life and like basically pushing back against the genocides of the oceans and other sorts of things. And so he put the fish on one to symbolize what they're trying to, to do with that global initiative and number 14, the global initiative. Now you could say, well, that's a big, that's just a cover for it or something. But I'm just saying, you know, <laughs> if there's a good benefit of the doubt and it's extremely reasonable that, and it's right there in the emails, why do we have to sensationalize it and make it, oh, he's definitely part of a society, secret society that we actually have no idea if he is or not. I mean, we know they sort of exist to some obscure degree. We have no statistics on these things. We have no, you know, and it's so easy to point out, oh, this person's being a little odd or using odd language. And the code, half of it's odd and ha half of what is pointed out, maybe there should be more looked into it. The other half is clear sensationalism and misunderstanding, like the, the whole napkin thing. Um, I think that goes out the window, but anyway, so the, these are things, right? So we're talking about circumstantial evidence, a big pile of it. And if we're going to say, well, it's one right. or the other, uh, there's absolutely reasonable explanations for almost everything. And maybe for the small chalk of things, there's not fine. Keep looking into it, but I want to refine what is good evidence. I want to at least, yeah, bring out, okay, what's junk in this case? What's not? I dug into Sandy Hook. The lesson I really dug into conspiracy was Sandy Hook. I went through that pretty rigorously because I really wanted people to say just to apply the best standards of evidence and say, well, what is good evidence here and what is not? And about all the dozens of pieces of evidence that were prayed out in front of me, I ended up with like two or three at the end that I could say, okay, that's really interesting and I'll still hang my head on that. And I still do. But so much of it was garbage that it really casts a shadow on this entire thing and casts a shadow on really on how we collect evidence and judge evidence. I think it's a lot of just consumerism. We're just consuming this story and we're participating in it as if we're actually revealing anything when in fact we're just consuming and perpetuating sensationalism. Is that a fair objection? I don't think there's anything wrong with that though. As long as you're honest, as long as you say, like I say, I consume media. I, I listen to always record because I find it entertaining and I do a lot of driving and the the shows generally go for a decent length and I can start it when I pull out of my driveway and uh, I'll get about halfway through it when I reach my destination and I'll finish it when I return to my driveway. So it is the perfect form of entertainment for me in that sense, as is YouTube, as are... Uh, television shows or radio programs or film or I like to go to the gallery. I mean, I would really like to go and see David Hockney's exhibition, which is at the National Gallery of Victoria at the moment. Uh, I would love to go and listen to Wagner's The Rings Cycle, which is being performed in Melbourne at the moment. Like, I categorize everything as entertainment and not research. I can't say that going to Wagner's The Ring Cycle, I was researching his involvement in Nazism, if that makes sense. But the question I have is, I know, Alan, you have a niece, is that correct? Sorry, yeah, I was muted. Yes, yes, I do. Okay, so in light of what I've said, in light of what Thomas Sheridan said, and in light of what John has said, 
right? And I think this is all important. We should we should be able to have a conversation where we push back on each other. Let's not be an echo chamber. Let's not go yes, yes, yes. And uh, what is is it? Han Solo says, I don't know. My, I, I heard this once, but that's great, kid. But let's not all suck each other's dicks now. Anyway, what I was going to yeah, say is, yeah, I don't think it's Han Solo, you... but it's. Uh... Point well taken, oh, though. Yeah, no, I don't, and I don't think that's what we're here for. I came for the pizza, not the hot dogs. <laughs> oh. Would you take your niece to Comet Ping Pong? No. And, John, I don't know, but you you must have some children in your life who you, you look after from time to time. Would you be comfortable with any of them sort of um, having some connection with any of this. In what sense? That they've eaten in the restaurant? Yeah. Or I would be totally maybe... fine with that. If they came to me and said, hey, someone touched me inappropriately in this restaurant, I might raise a fucking eyebrow. But as far as we know, that hasn't even been put on the table as a piece of evidence. So I would be fine with it to That's answer your question. That's my point. I That's would be fine with point. it. There's one Periscope that I was able to find, and, and I'm not familiar with the platform of Periscope. Is it some like live streaming thing you can do off your phone or whatever? I found one, one of the restaurant, and I mean that that's a, an indictment on these people who are claiming to be invested in this from a research perspective. It's not enough to go to Google Maps and type in an address and go, oh, look, it's next to this and next to that. Um, that, <laughs> you know, I, I promised myself I wouldn't bring up Jan Irving's name in this interview. Maybe we can cut this bit out. But to me, that's the kind of research that leads to those guilt by association connections that, that he made. Well, uh, it's funny. Um Guilt by association in a sense of trying to slander or, or, or some sort of, oh, I don't know, like, seems like a scarlet letter type, like, branding of, like, these people are this or that. Just to be clear, like, when you asked the question about my, my niece, would I take her or would I feel comfortable with taking her to this pizzeria or something like that? You know, there's, there's two sides to that, right? One is the – there's a lot of fucking good pizzerias in New York you can go to. So to me, there's no sense of even having that uh, – taking that chance, let's say. And again, I would apply a different set of standards to something for myself or something for a small child that I care about. I'll take a lot more chances with myself and my own body and my own well-being than I will with someone's child, you know? The other side of that is I also take it a step further of like I'm I'm weirdly specific about, you know, am I going to give money to any institution that even if they're not molesting children, they're supporting politicians who are bombing children or something. You know, if you're if you're a big fucking supporter of the Clinton Empire and you own a pizzeria, dude, I don't need to fucking give you any money for pizza. Like there's plenty of other pizzerias I can go to. I've avoided restaurants for less than that and i think the parading out of oh this man has a homosexual relationship with another homosexual from the democratic party and this nick you're talking about history and the tying of homosexuals with pedophilia which again is not proven by anything it's been far-right speculation since gay people tried to assure themselves of some protections under the law and so on. So that's been the blowback from that. And so there's this quiet undercurrent, because when we really talk about where citizen journalism, uh, citizenry, holding people's feet to the fire, so on, and analyzing the partisan soil that it all comes out of, you know, where did the original story come out of? We can dissect this under the trust discussion if we get there. But I will say, like, for example... This story came from a, a Trump forum subreddit from an anonymous person existing in Web 2.0 that is full of sadomasochistic behavior 
and childishness and regression and arrested development. <laughs> and it's all behind the veil of an avatar and total unaccountability. Okay. Now, can I, can I speculate for a minute? Just let, just let me finish my thought, but then okay. I would be more willing to trust or look into the original story of say when the CIA was found to be smuggling drugs into low income black communities in California. And that was tied to the Iran-Contra affair and other things. And this was broken open by a journalist named Gary Webb, who worked for the San Jose Times. He was a real person with real credentials, uh, unless you want to just believe that everything is made up. And so he was held accountable to certain standards. Uh, there's a, a journalistic code of ethics, all these things, you know, do no harm, double check your sources, make sure, blah, 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 blah. The people that are... Uh, participating in these, I'm not saying you have to be perfect, but I'm saying if you're going to go on a crusade about it, there's a lot of crusading about this. Like, here's the boogeyman, here's the other, it's the Podestas, it's the Clintons. While at the same time, this sort of boogeyman behavior is emblematic of our own inner fascist and our own need to say, look, here's the problem when what the fuck am I doing? What the fuck are my neighbors doing? What the fuck are the people in my community doing? to make things better. Instead, we're just saying, oh, it's child molesters in the Democratic Party or something. You know, it's very cheap to me. It's very cheap and reductionist. It's Newtonian. It looks at one cause for everything. But we're in a complex system of causes and effects, nonlinear system. <laughs> Not everything is as it seems. And so anyway, that was the end of my thought. And you can go off of wherever you were going to jump off of. I just had to finish that. Oh, I fully appreciate that. My speculation, and and I want to be clear that this, what I'm about to say, is purely speculation. There are two connected thoughts here. The first is that we are now confronted with a cacophony of voices in what was once a very narrow media space. And everybody, absolutely everybody, apart from a very, very, very slim minority, got it wrong about the election result. So we have some, I don't know how to phrase it, uh, pushback because of that with, you know, finger pointing and whatever else. And, and, and people are saying, it's fake news. It's fake news on Facebook. It's fake news on Twitter. YouTube was the problem. And because these people were effectively shut into echo chambers that made them low information voters, we, we have a, we have a problem with, you know, how information is disseminated. And Hillary Clinton, years ago now, when she was Secretary of State, spoke about how she believes America are losing the information war. So here's my speculation. We have absolutely no evidence. We, 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 have, we have nothing. But, as John pointed out, there are people who are inserting their own sort of implication into what this evidence shows. And I mean, in one sense, I want to say, for fuck's sake, I live in another country halfway around the world. Why am I talking about pizza gate? <laughs> right? But on the other hand, I want to say, hang on, this is actually a very significant issue because all... <laughs> I can see this happening. And again, this is speculation. This isn't any kind of divination or I haven't looked into any kind of oracle or done the runes to get to this point or anything like that. But what I'm trying to say is how convenient that in the midst of a fake news narrative going on, we have this uh, free-for-all based on, you know, WikiLeaks. And so, and this is controversial to say, but in terms of, of Pizzagate, at this stage, the only victim is John Podesta. 
I wouldn't like my email history to be broadcast all over the web. And it's innocuous, you know. It's me deleting 20 times a day, hey, penis enlargement pills, make your dick four inches longer. <laughs> um, you know, or me saying stuff to my girlfriend like, hey, baby doll, I love you, uh, I can't wait to see you. Like, I, it, 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 There's an element of privacy that has nothing to do with hiding something. It's to do with not wanting to communicate, right? So to that extent, yeah, there is something from the lexicon, from from a point of view of, of as I said, um, linguistics that is odd here, and I have questions, But what I can see happening is we have all this smoke, and what if the smoke isn't caused by a fire, but it's caused by a dry ice machine? And everybody is just being herded up again, and and the the sort of the fans of the flames, to mix metaphors, are, are being fanned, and everybody is rounded up into this whole Pizzagate thing, and it goes viral, and this and that and the other, and then there is an investigation. And there is a massive, you know, they're, they're all arrested and they're all um, denied bail and they all have to sit in holding cells. And then the trial comes out and a whole lot of ugly stuff comes out. But in the end, they're you know, all the way up to Hillary and Bill Clinton and all of that. And they're all found not guilty. And then how convenient is that in two years after an, a long trial, first of all, I mean, just from a 24-hour news cycle point of view, having Hillary Clinton actually on trial, my gosh, wow, ratings galore. I mean, remember when Bill Clinton and and Boris Yeltsin and the first thing they said to each other when they saw each other at the airport is, do you think he did it? And they both knew that they were talking about OJ. I mean, that would be the best thing for them. So... And then the second best thing for them would be to turn around and say, you know, Hillary's been acquitted. She did nothing wrong. Look at what we've put her through, this poor woman, this sick woman, this, you know, upstanding citizen who's done so much for our country, blah, 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 and look at how we treated her. You know, to quote John Rappaport, we need no more fake news. And then they take every single person including us right now, who even commented or mentioned Pizzagate and say, fake news, shut them down, ban them, suppress them. So that's my first speculation. My second speculation is it's all true. It actually happened. And if that is the case, then we absolutely need the trial because without it, I don't think people will be wanting to believe it. And when I say people, I mean... People who are not interested in in spending hours at a time on YouTube willingly looking for it, but if you just bring it up on the subway train or on the bus or at work and you say, oh, have you heard about this Pizzagate thing? I don't know about it. Seems pretty suspicious. What do you think? They're going to say, I don't know. What is a Pizzagate? What is that, right? So to some extent, if it is true, then we absolutely need that trial so that we can point to it and go, you know, these children are complaining about satanic rituals. Or, hang on, we better take this seriously because remember Pizzagate? Remember what Hillary Clinton and all that were up to? So I go both ways on it. Either way, the point is I'm saying that we should have a legitimate trial, and that doesn't mean that we're going to get the truth. That just means that... We're going to have an adversarial system in which they get a chance to defend themselves and there is a chance to ask some very serious questions. And real real quick, just to bring up the fake news concept and the pushback against quote-unquote fake news. Of course, I wouldn't want my, if I wrote a story that uh, somehow hit on the truth and then was labeled fake news and these sorts of things, I can see it the same way a label like terrorist can marginalize something. It's It's these words that marginalize things. I get it. We shouldn't be censoring necessarily. But, you know, I think people, there should be like a fair discussion about what people, what is dangerous, or or in a sense, like what kind of, the way stories are presented, how is it dangerous? For example, the whole manufacturing of the Iraq war, 
was fake news, but it was from the government. It wasn't from the mob. But here we are with sort of the same sort of piecing together, you know, Colin, Colin Powell will hold up the little bottle of anthrax and say, look, this is evidence of something. And everyone can say, oh, we know he had anthrax, so he must have done it. And this sorts of shit, right? So this is, these are the sorts of, I see the same sorts of connections and so on that could start a war working itself out in a mob. And so I don't really care if the government does it or the mob does it. I find it troubling. And so while I can see your appreciation for people getting involved in these stories and pushing back against the power structures, the mob is a very real thing. <laughs> people, if you read enough psychology and you interact with enough people, there's a lot of arrest development in this world, and especially in the Western world, a lot of regressive, neurotic, confused people. And not that I'm on a a different level, but in some respects I am. I'm not the best. There's all kinds of things I'm confused about. I don't know, but look, there's a lot of stupidity and violence and really ass-backwards behavior. And so you can't always just trust the people either. They have to be critiqued <laughs> as a collective, and that's us. We are part of the public. So what, how is the public going about its business? And if it's going about its business in constructing narratives the same way the fucking corrupt government is constructing their narratives to sell a war, and in this way we're trying to be sold a war on pedophilia and the, the evil satanic Clinton family, like they're part of a big machine. They are not. It's crazy how they, the compartmentalization that goes on. It's like the Clintons are somehow separate from the far right and whatever we call the left in America. It's, it's quite monolithic. It's superficial in the differences. And this is how partisan politics plays out in the States is it's a constant demonization of the other. And here's another other. And we're not even talking about this in the larger context of human trafficking and so on. Like, we're not even bringing in these, these discussions either. Like, the, the depth of work that's been done on, on human trafficking, sex trafficking, child trafficking by many, many people. And so the question is, why isn't that ever coming in? It's just like, oh, here's, here's this. And so there's not even connection being made. There's, I don't find a true commitment to building community, to building a way forward, to building a solution to anything. I just think it's more fucking mob stuff, and we're all just looking for a new other to pin the problems on. Yeah, John, if, you, if I could jump off that, that's something I've noticed. This was my first reaction. Unfortunately, it's, you know, but I don't want it to be as the boy who cried wolf thing or that it's or whatever. It's uh, kind of what Nick was saying of like, you know, you kind of get the the tar on the subject and then you just credit the whole thing. But the when I hear the whole idea of the satanic thing, you know, the satanic pedophile yeah. ring or, or all this sort of stuff, it puts a bad taste in my mouth because we have, you know, we had the Catholic Church got caught covering up massive pedophilia. Thank you. And what was done about that? Who's in fucking jail over that, right? But they're Christians, so we're not going to freak out. These, these same crusaders are not out there saying we have to protect people from Christian sex abuse or – um as you say, just just human trafficking in general. It's a huge it's a huge topic. You have plenty of work to be done. You could volunteer, activism, all that sort of stuff. But you'd rather sit online and be like, "See, this reinforces my belief about satanic power elites," as if like fucking a child for Jesus is somehow not as bad as fucking a child for Satan. You know, like somehow that you that's just that's a that line power. too far. That's a line you too far. Now you say that though. You what? cannot just say fucking a child for Jesus. You need to explain what you mean by that. I'm saying if let's just say this guy, John Podesta, has got you know, markings on his hand that could connect him to a quasi occult organization. I saw something I you know uh, a researcher, Tracy Twyman, put up this thing trying to connect Kabbalistic imagery that one of the women, one of the women who had done paintings that were connected to the other, like I think decorated the pizzeria. She had also done these other paintings about child, like that seems to depict child rape. 
I mean, they're fucked up images. They're fucked up images. But then she'd also done some imagery with using uh, the Kabbalistic tree and trying to, like, just connect these dots. Like, well, clearly this person's into this sort of occult child abuse, blah, blah, blah. My point is, is it somehow more of a crime to abuse a child and be into weird occult stuff than it is to abuse a child as an atheist or a Christian or a Catholic or a Buddhist or a Muslim or any fucking thing? Why, like, why would that even... What's that great line in Wayne's World? What's his name from... um... Modern Family and uh, Married with Children says it, and he goes, "If you kill a man in the heat of battle, you're a hero. But if you kill a man in the heat of passion, you're a murderer." You know, I guess like you, you gotta have some kind of objectivity in the sense of, hang on a second, an action is an action, and all actions have consequences. Whether you want to take it to Newtonian thing and be like every action has an equal and opposite reaction, I think that, uh, John, you pointed out that sort of a Newtonian worldview is very limited, and I would say that's true because Newton was operating off some silent discourses, which we don't necessarily have time to unpack, but definitely when he was operating there was a a much stronger connection with formalized religion and scientific inquiry than there is now. So much like Galileo, a lot of his work was done to prove the magnificence of God, let's put an end to it there in terms of the silent discourse, rather than perhaps a more objective point of view, and that's not to say that you have to be an atheist to be a scientist, of course not, but at the same time, if you're doing science from a framework that is pre-built, prefabricated, that says Jesus loves all, then you're going to tank the results, much the same as if you're looking into Pizzagate with a prefabricated framework that says satanic demons exist and they suck on the blood of children and you need to cut them while you rape them in order to gain their life energy, then of course you're going to come to certain conclusions regarding the limited evidence that we've been presented with. Yeah, and I just what I want to reinforce and what I or back up what Alan was saying there, it's just and I've said it already, but just to restate, it's, it seems politicized, it seems very convenient. Like you said, it sounds like maybe it's a red herring for something else. We could debate about what that something else is, but I often just see these as convenient distractions for people. That's what I was talking about consuming earlier. I'm not saying that all consuming is bad or that consuming is unnatural. Like we take in food, energy, we are consuming machines. That is our nature. I get that. But when I say consuming, it has certain connotations that it denotes a certain passivity, a certain unquestioning, a certain sense of self-righteousness and aggrandizement, even in the face of really not doing anything, and also being sort of compartmentalized and, and so on and so forth. It goes on and on. And our identities are not well developed, and so we get towed along by these sort of mainstream narratives or these mainstream herd. We're herd animals. When I see people just falling into herd behavior, I get a little disturbed, whether it's from my side or the other side. It doesn't matter. We have to be more intelligent than that. Can I just, I just want to sort of bring some of this together as some of my concerns that have come out of this. And again, I want to be this really fucking clear or, or hopefully, hopefully as clear as possible. And it's not to say that I'm being dismissive of this subject. That's not where I'm going with this. But to say, like, uh, I do have some concerns that are raised in these issues of selective prosecution. And, and by prosecution, I mean in the sort of mob mentality that John was talking about. Uh, so, again, you know, we'll get – it's politically convenient to get – to jump at these, quote-unquote, satanic, quote-unquote, democratic pedophiles or whatever. And, again, if they're – if they – really have committed a crime, fucking trash them, you know, do that. 
but so there's that. I don't see an overall caring about the subject as a whole. It's, you know, some some of the sub some of the examples that have been brought out somewhat into the light and could be pushed further. Uh, there's another side of this is uh, Nick, your your comment on right. How does this tie into the quote unquote fake news meme that's going around? It just seems really strange. Like strange timing. Uh, is that part of the cover up? Is that uh, or is this a way to further kind of muddy the waters? All this sort of stuff. And but there's a third thing here, which is uh, probably for most people doesn't strike them as the thing to get upset about, but I just want to sort of put one more thing in here, is, uh, Nick, you said earlier about questionable use of the First Amendment, but there's this idea of, of free speech, of freedom of thought and expression. So the paintings that we, we've seen, there are some that are kind of like stick figures that look like big stick figures raping little stick figures. It sure looks like child rape. There's the more uh, photorealistic renderings of children being tied up, uh, tied to chairs, tied to a wall. Um, they look rapey as fuck. Um, they are disturbing. They are something I certainly would – I feel uncomfortable even looking at. Uh, you know, I don't consider myself like a prudish person, but it's like – it's kind of fucking creepy. That being said, there's – a strange danger as I see it. I want to be really careful how I say this, but just to be totally blunt, there's a danger in the taste in artwork or the painting of depicting of something being in itself somehow incriminating. Well, there's no victim in the artwork, right? <laughs> it's ink Shh. on paper. So it's it, 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 in terms of what you're saying... It is, I would rather, right, have somebody who has inklings towards that kind of thing express themselves through art than to impose upon them my worldview and insist that they perform some kind of repression. And I think if you've any familiar familiarity with Willem Reich or Willem Reich, then you would agree that repression is where we start to, where, where things start to go wrong. So, as far as artwork goes, I, I agree. They're not pictures that I would want to hang in my house, but even, okay, it, let's say, for example, um, my neighbors are very young kids, and when it's hot, they like to run under the sprinkler, right? And sometimes they're not fully dressed when they do it. Now, if their parents take a photo to embarrass them at their 21st birthday, then that's fine. Where the line is drawn is if you are making the children do that against their will. So we have to be very careful with the medium of artistic expression. I think that we need to have artistic expression that documents the darker inklings of our id, collective id, um, because otherwise it's going to seek manifestation in another realm and, you know, that's dangerous. Additionally, by sort of being tolerant, if I can use that word, of this kind of artwork, it at least kind of almost creates a honeypot where we can say, okay, this culture is borderline dangerous. But I would take it to the same thing as um, who are those uh, farmers in the Midwest who fought the government over land and cows and things like that. Do you know what I'm talking about? You said the Bundys? Yeah, the Bundys, right? Now, you wouldn't say they were a cult or a militia, but you definitely sort of would say they're not in 
they're not towing the status quo line. Therefore, they're outliers. Therefore, they're on the fringe. And the fringe is where things can be either very innovative and very positive for change in society or incredibly dangerous and incredibly regressive for society. So the fringe is always something we have to look at. And I would say this artwork, which, as you said, Alan, is disturbing. Uh, it's certainly not something I would be wanting to um, uh, publicly advocate for in any kind of way. But at the same time, I mean... You know, it's art, right? There's always weird art. I mean, look at Alien. Look at Giger. I mean, we hold him up as an idol, or some of us do, and like as, a, as inspirations. We're all inspired by some weird fucking art. If anyone looked at our computers and saw what was on there, they'd probably be, you know, that's what I'm always afraid of. Can these things be turned against us? Well, that's, that's my, sorry, yeah, that's, that's, you said, John, you said something earlier about being careful of our inner fascist, you know, it's like what – okay, again, so yeah, I, I, don't, I hate to have qualifying that I don't like this artwork, but to say there's such a – when Nick, you're with this idea of the fringes and what comes out of it, is it the, the artwork that's, that's going to be the dangerous thing or the sort of furthering and furthering of, of censorship and a sort of um, – smack down on what is acceptable what is allowed or what is it's just it feels like such a tricky and, and dangerous precedent and again i know it's this is no like legal maneuver being like this this artist isn't being put in prison for these paintings or something it's just that mob mentality going oh look this person has this painting clearly they are pedophile or queerly they're a criminal or whatever it's like that's that's a line i'm not willing to cross and i I get it it's it's more smoke when when put in the context of all these other things it's definitely suspicious or, or creepy or something but i don't feel i don't feel comfortable even figuratively prosecuting someone based on their art preferences well, I think this is a good time to bring up something that is bothering me a little bit when we're talking about art, is each of these episodes of Always Record has a picture associated with it. And I would like to request that the artwork and the title of this conversation and it, it's not for the sake of self-censorship, but just for the sake of all of us. I would rather it be titled something along the line of what is fake news rather than Pizzagate. Yeah. Just so that we can be one step removed and say we're on the outside looking into this rather than we're joining the herd and, and let's get to the bottom of this and rah, rah, rah. Yeah, and Nick, I do appreciate your level-headedness and how you approach these things, because you probably, you are outside the matrix to a degree, you're not in this country, so it doesn't mean the same things to you, and the same way I'm able to look at other countries' situations and feel them out differently, not necessarily coming to any more truth, per se, but definitely not being triggered emotionally, you know, it's, uh, when it's your own system, you take a bit more ownership of it, and you find a bit more disgust in it, but there's also more nuance to being involved with it, too, and so I guess bringing these two perspectives together is really productive and just you even coming in and trying to frame the discussion in a more responsible way where I'm, I'm very flippant and I'm usually a bit, (laughs) I use this as an opportunity not to censor myself. I just appreciate that. That's, you know, how, how do we really look at these things and before attaching words to them that immediately trigger that emotional response and get us into a level of our brain that is then operating and can actually controlling our prefrontal cortex. I mean, there's a whole brain technology thing that's going on here too, and neurophysiologically, and the people don't even consider. And what, how does regression actually work in the moment and so on? So this goes, this can go on, but so there's a lot of layers to it. And that's, I guess, bringing you on at least helped me start to dig through the surface material. And we can call this whatever you want. And I appreciate you coming on and <laughs> lending your voice. Well, if we can call it whatever we want, can we call it Festina Lente? I'd like that to be a meme. 
That's the hurry slowly. slowly. Yeah. Yeah. And so you have the I, cover of Bram Stoker's Dracula as the image. So uh, I dropped in this. I'm glad you said something because my my intention was to use this garbage pail kids image. <laughs> see in the chat here. I was going to base the episode image off of that. <laughs> I don't know. I, how do I get to the chat? Uh, look the little like comic book word bubble, word balloon. Oh, this one. There it is. Let's have a look. Oh, oh definitely not. <laughs> <laughs> Dracula, it is. Well, well, actually, I think this is maybe a good time to return to what I actually wrote. Because we're circling around this issue of media and trust. So yeah. is it okay if I return to what I wrote? Of course. Well, as I say, it's just before you go too too deep here, I just want to give a heads up to both of you. I'm probably not long for this conversation. I was supposed to go to see a movie at 11 o'clock my time. Do you want to try 15 more minutes? Can you do that? I'll I'll hang out. I'll try and push another fifteen minutes on my end. And if you guys want to continue, that's you know figure out what you guys want to do. I just want to sort of yeah. Want to give that that's fine. Time. That's fine. All right, go ahead, Nick. Well, I just I think Andras's question was really important, and I think that we should dissect it a little bit. So, if we recall, what he asked was, "What media sources do you trust?" Something along those lines. So, this has been a question that we've all sort of had to wrestle with since what I've called in my notes, the grand confusion of the awakening. So that first moment when you're like, hang on, 9-11, that doesn't make sense, what's going on? Or hang on, global financial crisis, why didn't anyone pick up on this? Why were subprime mortgage, mortgages, blah, blah, blah. Whatever whatever it happens to be, hang on, Iran-Contra, whatever it is, there's that moment when you're like, I can't necessarily be passive in taking in this information. So for me, my first few years of delving down the conspiracy rabbit holes led to uh, great consternation in regard to learning how to identify and deconstruct stimulus in order to determine signal from noise. And I think that we've all gone through that. We've all gone through that pain of what can what makes sense anymore, the world is topsy-turvy, Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. And if we feel that pain, and we try to deal with that pain by wanting a simple, short form of digestible information or a authoritarian leader, I think if you just go off something basic like approval ratings, I, would, I don't remember what they were, but I would like to point to, and I'd like to look at the approval ratings of Bush 43 prior to 9-11 and after 9-11. And I think that there was an aspect of we need leadership. We need someone who can tell us what to do so that I don't have to worry about it and I can get on with, uh, you know, feeding my kids and making sure they go to school. But we're not in that realm. I think that we like things that are complex, that have multiple moving parts, that require a little bit of concentration. We've been talking for an hour and a half now, and that is testament to the fact that we enjoy concentrating on a topic and trying to understand it at a root level. So how can we answer Andras, Andras's question? I don't know how to mm-hmm. answer that. Anyway. How can we answer the question? The simple answer would be don't trust anybody, DTA. And when it comes to something like CNN, and and I deliberately pick on CNN here because that's a news feed that is uh, available to Australians via their affiliation through the Nine Network. So our international news through something called Nine Nightly News or Network 9 News, whatever it's called, comes from CNN. It has the exact same fanfare, etc., etc. So it's basically the Australian affiliate. So that's why I pick on it. And this would be relatively sound advice. Don't trust CNN. 
However, I I think we need a much more nuanced approach, especially when it comes to citizen journalism. So I'll pick on another person who I admire, which might be Richard Grove or it might be James Corbett. And we can we can talk about specific instances later. But I I think simply to say don't trust anybody is actually intellectually dishonest because we all have biases, we all seek authority on particular topics, and we all have strong emotional ties to personal experiences that shape our worldview. For me, I will take Thomas Sheridan's opinion with less of a grain of salt than I might take, take, say, you mentioned Tracy Twineman before. So I have perhaps, you could say, built up a more of a trust relationship with someone like Thomas Sheridan, and I found his information to be more useful. No, and they, but they, and they both have huge fucking blind spots. Sheridan, Sheridan started sucking Trump's dick, you know, a few months ago. W- whatever. You know, Twyman's, you know, milking the satanic panic. And uh, Thomas, who I appreciate that he hasn't fallen into that, and he's... Yeah, he's, 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 he's resisted, uh, or, or spoken out against that sort of, that, that, that bullshit panic there. Whatever. Everyone, I'm, I'm sure someone listening could say Alan's got this huge blind spot. I'm sure someone who knows you really well could tell you, Nick, what your blind spots are. I'm just saying, like, yeah, everybody has to be taken with a fucking grain of salt. But we gravitate. That's what sure. I'm saying here. It, it's intellectually dishonest to say, Okay, every single piece of media that you inherit, that you consume, you now need to take away, you need to think about it, you need to assess it, you need to look for the logical help. No one's going to do that. They're just going to say, fuck off, take your reading list and shove it up your ass. I like Peter Hitchener, or I like Rachel Maddow, you know. She seems friendly to me, whatever it happens to be. I happen to like Thomas Sheridan or Neil Kramer or you guys. So I'm more inclined to take what you say at face value. But we'll get into the issue of trust in a little bit. All I'm saying is that to simply say, oh, you can't trust anybody, I don't trust anybody, is a lie. It's an absolute lie because you do trust people. And I do trust certain sources, but I'm going to add a layer of complexity to that when we define the term trust. So I think firstly, though, we need to define the term media to answer Andras's question. And this is something that as a, as a person involved in the higher education system who has to mark a lot of exams and a lot of exams that talk about media without qualifying it, I have had the opportunity to really think long and hard about in order to be able to provide accurate criticism to to 21, 22, 23-year-olds' work, right, their essays. And I have to write comments on them, and so I need to be able to stand from a point of view of saying, this is how to approach this particular topic. When you talk about media, you need to unpack it in the following way. And so from that sort of foundation, I think the first thing we need to point out is that, of course, media is the plural form of medium. And just go back through the always record catalog and you'll find more than enough discussion on on what medium means you know, how channels are used and how this represents certain things in language beyond the common understanding. You look at the fact that we spell words, spell has a connotation from magic, etc., etc. But for the purposes of this discussion, I think that media can be categorized into three main groups. So I would say there's the traditional media and I'm going to, again, like I said, windowless room. I'm using traditional media to try and scrub it of connotations. I think that a lot of people who who are listening to this may be more familiar with the term mainstream media, but that already has negative connotations. It's basically the equivalent in the opposite and uh, equal.
equal way, if someone calls me a conspiracy theorist, I might say, well, you're a subscriber to mainstream media, and basically we're both saying to each other, you smell, right? But the, the traditional media has a certain structure, and that's worth looking at. So it's an institution, it's a business model, it has layers of production and distribution, its platforms are traditionally things like radio, newspaper, and television. Okay, the next category is alternative media, and the third category is social media. So I'll talk about alternative media for a moment. This is a rather nebulous term, and I think it is one that really requires a firm definition. And the reason that alternative media is far less concrete than traditional media is that it's not a platform. It's in fact a position, and it's a position that we've taken today, and it's a position that commentators take. So this is not a phenomenon that's emerged recently. It goes all the way back to perhaps even the Nag Hammadi Scrolls, and it's what Foucault would call a genealogy. It's offering a position of dissent from a commonly ex accepted stance on a particular subject. So in other words, alternative media is commensurate with dissent, just as traditional media is commensurate with homo homogeny or hegemony. So just to take it from the abstract and put it into the concrete, some examples of alternative media range from broadcast radio like the Alex Jones Show and the Infowar franchises to micro-productions such as the Corbett Report and other platforms which may include YouTube. However, alternative media in contemporary society, especially in regard to what may be colloquially termed the conspiratorial concepts, dates at least back as far as the 1990s with investigations into the Clintons being conducted prior to the internet. And here we have things like celestial radio shows like Coast to Coast AM, Ground Zero Radio in the US, and these are both emergent products of a particular culture. And then going all the way back, you've got websites such as disinformation.com uh, and geocity sites and things like that that road on this initial wave of web traffic. I have sort of found in my research that the major shift occurred in 2006 through to 2008. And this is the introduction of Web 2.0. So Web 2.0, this is a highly relevant as it signifies the moment when multimedia became a major part of the internet in terms of interaction and more specifically in terms of the propagation of alternative media. So, as I said, sites such as YouTube, but also sites such as Reddit and 4chan, Facebook, MySpace, and many others allow individuals onto the market and to market themselves in such a way that they're able to find an audience. So, for me, what does alternative media mean? It means it's a form of communication that's one-to-many, and it's one-to-many communication that's reciprocated in a form of many-to-one. So here personalities such as Freeman Fly of Freeman TV are notable and there is also a link between the second and third forms of media which we need to distinguish. If alternative media is the second type of media that is nothing more than a technological expression of a historically continuous and always ongoing form of expression called dissent, then the third form of contemporary media is social media the digital equivalent of the town square where we can have a many-to-many -many form of communication. So whether this is the amphitheatre of ancient Greece, the Globe Theatre of Elizabethan England, or the politically active Tiananmen Square of Communist China, social media is an old concept repackaged for the digital age. So here we have platforms such as, again, YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and many others, including things like Pandora, Stitcher, eBay, Amazon, and the list goes on and on. So what I think you will have noticed at this point, dear listener, is that there are specific sites such as YouTube that actually sort of straddle or traverse categories. So that is kind of the concrete, and that's not really important. What is important is the conceptual framework. So to summarize, traditional media is a hierarchical structure with top-down direction. Alternative media is the 
consent characterized by one-to-many communication reciprocated by a many-to-one communication, and social media is the unfettered form of many-to-many communication, what I would say is the digital equivalent of the town square. So that's sort of my take on media. How do you guys feel about that? Alan, do you have anything to say? Because I know you only have a few minutes of that. Yeah. Um, so the Vardis was uh, uh, based off what you wrote there. I mean, yeah, I uh, I think it's a, a really – it's not the end-all, be-all assessment of our, of our media landscape, but it's a great fucking starting point. And uh, at least as far as the conversation we're trying to have here, I, well, I do like your sort of three-point structure. I'm sure if, uh, you know, we can – we can always break things down into different sort of uh, subgenres or anything like that, but I definitely see the sort of chronology and uh, not just the chronology, but the um, maybe the position. It's, it's a McLuhan-esque like medium is the message. I like, yeah, alternative media by its very defini- definition is the sort of it's if it's alternative, alternative to what and what is it sort of standing in opposition to? I think these are pretty on point assessments so as far as right when andra says what media do you trust you know or what media source i mean these are this is the other thing i was trying to raise earlier of like a lot of media is is it a source or is it an aggregator is it a commentary is it what you know what i would also maybe take that twist on it so is there a media source where does the the media originate from where is the story is the narrative being passed on like a game of telephone you know there's a there's a fire at the local whatever and it's on your nightly news the cameraman is going to put their twist on it they're they're passing on the eyewitness says something to them they're passing along to you there's a game of telephone happening where that's constantly shifting through these different iterations as well yeah i don't think i'm gonna be able to say anything uh uh too too vast in this in this moment but i just i appreciate that you're that you're you know making some of these points which are uh i think an excellent sort of foundation for a bigger conversation like this i i'll leave that there to say i i appreciate that you're laying this foundation because i think this is this is gonna be more and more important you know that that always record 167 what's funny to me is so i released it I don't know, like a week after it, had, we had recorded it or something, and in there we're, we discussed some of this like fake news concept. And in that week that it took me to get the episode actually up onto the internet, that's that concept or that talking point blew the fuck up. Um, and it's funny to see how at the time it was like, hey, this just looks like a really cut and dry case of of censorship. Uh, and I still think for a large part it is that, but to see in the time period between when we had that conversation, when the episode was released, and even where we're sitting right now, today, this is being recorded November 29th uh, by, by my time zone, um, You know, this idea of as this becomes more and more of a conversation piece, 